Okay, I'd like to welcome Gary Wadler to uh, our uh, program here. We're talking to distinguished leaders in sports medicine and exercise science here at ACSM meetings in New Orleans. So thank you for coming. My pleasure. I would like to just start, Gary, if you'd tell us a little bit about your current position and what you're doing now and the kinds of things you're involved in in your in your practice? Well, from day to day, I'm uh, practicing internal medicine, uh, my first love. Uh, but I've also been very involved in a variety of things uh, relating to uh, sports and sports medicine, and, and most notably in the area of uh, anti-doping, mm -hmm. uh, both nationally and internationally. Uh, I've been, have other interests that are related, and most recently I've been appointed the uh, Medical director of the American Ballet Theater. Oh, uh, working with educational programs to prevent injuries and in, in dance. Is that New York? Or? It's a it's a national program, but it's based in New based York. In, yeah. The American Ballet Theater is the national dance company of the United oh, wow. States by an act of Congress. So that's sort of interesting. That'll be fun. And I run the sports commission on Long Island called the Nassau County Sports Commission. So I sort of dabble in a few things. Been very involved over the years with women's sports and the Women's Sports Foundation. So uh, it's an interesting mix. So do you have a private practice there then? Or yeah, I'm a, a private practice, solo practice, uh, the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My first love is seeing patients. That's what energizes me and mm -hmm. uh, intellectually and otherwise. So, uh, but I, I tend to like to mix things up. You still so have time for this other I, stuff. I, I make time for these other things, sure. And uh, my wife and family are very understanding. and. Uh, as many of my colleagues in the American College of Sports Medicine were, were doing a lot of things in a lot of places. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Well, based on that, I want to go back a little bit and try to work out how you got there. Uh -huh. um, and maybe way back to the undergrad days when you, de when you decided, hey, I think I might go to medical school, uh, and then where you went, and uh, were you interested in sports then? Uh, those kinds of things, residency? How well, my life had no great design. I actually was going to be a, a chemical engineer. I went to, I grew up in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. as many of the population of the United States seems to have grown up yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh, I actually went to Brooklyn College, a uh, brief time to CCNY when I was considering engineering. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, in uh, 1960, I was accepted to Cornell Medical School. I was the only individual uh, in the entire city of New York to be accepted from Cornell, uh, wow. which was quite amazing. It was a class of 85, and I did my four years at, at Cornell Medical School, and then I did my internship and residency at the New York Hospital, which is part of Cornell Medical School. Uh, and then in 1969, I was sent out by the dean to North Shore University Hospital to help establish that is a teaching hospital of Cornell. Since at that time, Cornell had just left Bellevue Hospital, which was its oh, other teaching hospital. Okay. So, so this was in family medicine? It was a uh, residency? Well, my, no, it was internal medicine. Internal, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, okay. And, uh, and then I uh, got very involved with uh, acute care medicine. I established their intensive care unit, their, their first hemodialysis program. I ran their respiratory care unit, oversaw the emergency room. And by a fluke one day, some uh, trustee asked me if I can go to a, a meeting for him at the, being held in the community dealing with drug abuse. Hmm. And meaning in, this is in 1969 or so. Mm -hmm. At that time, meaning heroin and cocaine yeah. and marijuana. Yeah. And was, in those days, ex addicts were the therapists. And so I took a look at that and said, what role does the healthcare system play? or should it play in this whole issue of drug abuse. Mm -hmm. And that led to me uh, running a national conference uh, on defining the role of the healthcare system in the United States in the treatment of drug abuse. And I received a million dollar grant and started this drug program and, and did that for a while. And then I moved on to other things. And in, wow, in that's exciting. So that was sort of an interesting uh, that's side, but it had turns back to play a role in the, later. In, later in my life. Was that around 1970 then? I would say that was about 1970, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, it was widely uh, publicized and involved the White House, the Congress, uh, major uh, academic institutions, uh, hmm. Harvard and UCLA and, and, uh, and so on. So Johns Hopkins. So, years later, in 1979, 
uh, I had hit a big birthday and decided, well, this is a time to go change careers a little bit. And so I went to private practice. Okay. And as, as many things in life are strange coincidences, the, the people who managed the property where my office was happened to have built the National Tennis Center. And one day we're talking, he said, would you like to go to tennis matches? And I said, sure, and who wouldn't? And I went and I learned that uh, I want to see the medical uh, mm. set up. And I learned then that sports medicine at the time was primarily orthopedics. Mm. And the only doctor in the facility was an orthopedist. Yeah. And so uh, we talked about it. And the next year I wound up being uh, the internist uh, for the U.S. Open Tennis Championships and did that for 11 years. Uh, and so that would have been through the 80s? I left, my last year was 1991. Yeah. And that, there are many interesting stories, including about Martina's toxoplasmosis and so on at that time. But in the mid-1980s, somebody tapped me on the shoulder one day during the U.S. Open and said, we'd like to get a urine specimen from you. And I said, for what purpose? And I said, well, the ATP, the Association of Tennis Professionals, which is the Men's Tennis Association, decided to implement a drug testing program. And I said, okay. And so I went to the station with them, and they sent me in the men's room alone. I said, there's something wrong with this picture. Flashing back to 1969, Amazing. I know yeah, about observed sure. specimens. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? I looked at this issue from one perspective in 1969. Let me look at what we know about the healthcare system and medicine and doping. Yeah. Great. And I learned there was relatively little. That led to me writing a textbook called Drugs and the Athlete. I have it on my shelf. Which, as I, you know, yeah. uh, really uh, became uh, an important work in, in this time. Because yeah. yeah. uh, you had a chapter in there and all the uh, typical each, things. Each drug, its history, its yeah. physiology, its pharmacology, its chemistry, its uh, therapeutic use, how it's affected the sports performance, yeah. the detection. And it was not a contributor work. I had a co-author, Brian Hainline, mm -hmm. uh, and we literally wrote every chapter, every word in that book, except one, and that was on the legal aspects, and we had a lawyer dealing with that. Yeah, that was a, that's a landmark yeah. book. And so that sort of propelled this whole interest in it, and the rest evolved from that. But I had not gone to that thing in 1969, Isn't we wouldn't something? be sitting here today. Amazing. That's amazing. Well, <laughs> where along the way did you hear about the American College of Sports Medicine? Well, you know, I'm sort of atypical to most of my colleagues. I have no formal training in sports medicine. Yeah, yeah. I sort of was on the scene before it really took root in, in terms mm -hmm. of primary care and internal medicine. Yeah. Uh, so I, I knew immediately that if I was going to be involved with this, that I really had to go to the source. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to the ACSM and Jack Wilmore and John Ivey and others who were mm -hmm. gracious enough to nominate me for the things I had done in both in tennis and in the world of doping. Yeah. And that became the uh, beginning of a love affair with me and the American College of Sports Medicine. I've been intimately involved ever since. Uh, I bring certain things to the table oh, that yeah. others don't. Yeah. I've always been interested in, in public policy and it's clearly been interested in uh, uh, the issue of doping. And so uh, it was me reaching out and there was this place that I felt very comfortable and, mm -hmm. and so I sort of uh, used that as my mentor, if you will, yeah. to develop in sports well, medicine. Gary, were you also publishing in any of the medical journals or anything about the drugs before the book? Or, uh, or did you just go right to the book? Not on doping. I, not I on published doping. on other matters of drug abuse, but not on but doping. But not on the doping. Right. right. Okay. So yeah. most of that research went straight into the book. I yes. mean, you decided, yeah. hey, I'm going to do a book on this. Yeah, and, it took, uh, and remember, we didn't have computers the way right. we do. So, right. you know, I had a, a, a list of athletes who had been in the media, for example, uh, over the X period of years, and it took me months to get all those newspaper clips mm -hmm. from all over the world. Oh, yeah. well, now you can do it in a matter of minutes right. uh, by go Googling it or yeah. something. Right. So uh, <clears throat> it was done longhand in many ways and it was a labor of love, but it was every single night for two years. It mm -hmm. took a long time and it was good for me because I had to go back and revisit my physiology and mm -hmm. pharmacology and the very basics 
uh, which are important if you're going to deal with a subject such as and, and you did a lot of history too. Oh, you, you had to. It I mean, was the, that part of it is really, really very helpful because all this no stuff, one had an idea. Yeah, it all had to be in context. Yeah, and the whole issue absolutely. of doping has to be in context. Yep. And a historical perspective was, was absolutely yeah. critical. And well, uh, did, did after that, um, did you get involved then in any of the like the IOC or the NCAA or? Uh, was there anything, anything not, along those lines? Not directly, or? but I was honored in uh, 1993 to win the IOC President's Prize. Oh, wow. Uh, for the contributions I had made primarily through the book. Yeah, early on, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there were relatively few people focused on the issue of doping. Mm -hmm. And in, in the United States, there were relatively few. and. Uh, this resonated throughout the world. I was deeply honored, and it clearly mm -hmm. helped propel uh, my yeah. career. Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to remember if you were on committees and so forth. Well, my children, been, yeah, my, uh, I was on a number of committees. There was a youth committee I, I remember being on, but the two that I really have spent most of my time on have been public policy. I was on the first public policy committee with guys like Brian Sharkey mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, Russ Pate yeah. and, and others uh, spent a lot of time in, in, in the area of public policy, and then I got involved in the uh, uh, communications of public information. It's, it's morphed its title over the years, mm -hmm. but I've always had uh, a facility with the media, and so those are the two areas, and they sort of mutually reinforce each other. And, mm -hmm. and so I, uh, those are the major committees that I've been. How involved about with. Um, I, I'm not even. I'd have to go back and look. Does ACSM have a position stand or anything like that on doping, or is that more recent? No, they have a, one on anabolic steroids. Okay, were and you involved in that at all? Not that not? preceded me, actually. Oh, it did? I was not okay. involved with that. Okay. Uh, I've been okay. involved with a number of current comments, uh, and, but not in the, uh, the position stand. Okay. Um, in the in, in sort of the, the doping realm of things, was it anabolic steroids that sort of kicked everything off? And all I well, what really is, kicked it off was a guy named Ben Johnson in yeah, 1988. The sprinter. And uh, I actually appeared uh, in the halls of Congress with Ben Johnson when the Anabolic Steroid Act of 1990 was passed. It was his first appearance back in the United States. Wow. And it wasn't a formal session of Congress but it was in the halls of Congress. It was extremely well attended. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would say it was that Ben Johnson, what I call the Ben Johnson moment, okay. that opened the eyes of the world to the problem of doping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember, was it Lasse Varen uh, with, with the, uh, what were they doing? Something with the blood or, or something? There well, was, I don't you know. know. There, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Well, it, it has been for a long time. I mean, yeah. more recently, it was 1998. Uh, they found the paraphernalia in the, for the Tour de France. Yes. In the yeah. Festina team. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, much of the history of doping has not been positive doping tests. It's been other events equivalent to the Balcos of the world. I see. Uh, or the Festina thing, or the ha what happened at the most recent Tour de France, mm -hmm. uh, where there's been investigative action, police action, governmental action, that led to uh, the awareness of the... Of, of, of the problem. Of the, of the problem. Yeah. And so, you know, I've always said a good war and a war on drugs is, is a war. Uh, requires not only good technology, it needs good intelligence. And the intelligence part of the equation is becoming increasingly important in recent years, and we've mm -hmm. seen that in the United States and so on. So, and I've been involved with public, bringing it back to ACSM and outside ACM, and very much involved with public policy. I've been mm -hmm. a, you know, advisor to the White House, uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy. I testified before Senator McCain in 1998, 1999 which led to the formation of WADA and USADA. And clearly, I testified in the famed hearings before the House Government Reform Committee on baseball and the National Football League. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I've been very much involved in, yeah. in policy development. Any thought of doing a, 
a new edition no. of your book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a publisher. <laughs> no. I bet I, you've been asked that question. I've been asked so. that many, many times. Yeah. It was sort of disappointing, but, you know, uh, it helped engage me in the whole question of doping. Mm -hmm. But the marketplace for that is quite limited. Yeah. Uh, it really even, it's an academic book, although it did appear in, in bookstores, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't have a natural home. It's not taught in medical schools. Yeah. The Athletic Training Association is one little part of it. The mm -hmm. physical therapist says that, well, it's not our thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the undergraduate school said, well, it doesn't fit in any of our courses. It sort of uh, was out there and it had no place to, f to sit. And mm -hmm. uh, although I was interviewed widely about the book, uh, clearly uh, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience to write a book. You know, I have the book and I can't remember the date. 1989. 89, okay. okay. It's a red book. I remember. Red book. Oh, also well. on soft cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the last little bit of time, um, and you've been in, around ACSM a long time, any thoughts on where ACSM's gone since you got involved? And well, it's, it's sort of gone a perspective in, on it. It's gone in a direction that I personally uh, find interesting in that it was uh, much more of an intimate uh, college in terms of trying to reach the public. Uh, but I think over the years it's evolved into being a very important instrument about the role of exercise and sports medicine in our society yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And uh, so I think uh, the reach has become increasingly important. I'm happy to be chairing the CPI committee, uh, uh, Communication of Public Information, in developing methods to get the word out. And mm -hmm. I th as I see, and I've served on the board uh, in the past, uh, that clearly the feeling amongst the leadership of the colleges it's important for us to get our message out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Physical activity, obesity, the problems of safe sport, uh, youth sports, uh, uh, the female athlete triad, and go down the list. Yeah. But Absolutely. our impact is in the public. Mm -hmm. And I th that's sort of evolved, in my perspective, as being a priority. I think. And really, yeah. the charge that I was given as chairman of this committee to facilitate getting that's, our message out to yeah, the public. That's so important. What good is this research if we're not going to be able to apply it to something? Or yeah, and it's it. not restricted and to elite athletes. It's, exactly. It's, it's, it's everybody, really, it's really. everybody. It's yeah. everybody. It's a health issue. There's no yeah. question. And it, you see that you go to an annual meeting and you look at the agendas, and you'll see that there's so many different audiences that are being addressed. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that has really been something that's evolved. And I hopefully have played some small yeah. part in making that happen. Well, I've seen, too, uh, Gary, the, uh, the international spread now, too. I mean, it, 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 it was pretty localized, and the arms are no, look, extending. It, I, I, yeah. I know it's in the uh, uh, language when people talk about ACSM, mm -hmm. that it's the largest and most important sports medicine right. organization in the world. But in fact, it is. Uh -huh. And I traveled around the world a lot in, in the world of doping, and the esteem with which ACSM is held is, 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 is mind-boggling. Wow, I don't nice. think that people here realize to the extent, the extent this yeah. uh, organization is appreciated and recognized for being what it is. Uh, in fact, one of the, in some senses, they more know more about it abroad than they even know about it back I home. I think you're right. I, I was over at the international reception last night, and that place was packed. Yeah. Yeah. I could, uh, the number of people there from other countries was phenomenal. I mean, let's face it, there is no resource like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a strange amalgam, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Not only between educators, researchers, and clinicians, but the subject matter that each of those groups are dealing with. Yes. And so this yeah. cross-fertilization, which yeah. is what makes this thing really work. It's quite a rich, cross a rich environment. Extremely rich. Yeah. You cannot spend a week here without going home and, and feel you've been, your horizons have been expanded because of what you've been exposed to during yeah. that week. I, I've taken like 18 pages of notes yeah. and, and I haven't even been working at it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, Gary, thank you so much for, for coming by and, and chatting. And well, I'm uh, honored to be asked. It's my pleasure. It was, uh, it's a lot of fun and uh, we 
appreciate everything you've done. And so thank you. Thank you. Okay.